Hey everybody, uh, this is Fusebotic again. It's been a while since I uploaded a video, but I wanted to spend today talking about things that I wish I knew starting out as an artist. And uh, these are just some little general tips and uh, things about what it means to be an artist and what all that it takes. And um, just something that I wish I had first starting out, but I didn't. So the first thing to remember is start out with the fundamentals. Uh, pick up a book about anatomy, form, lighting, materials, uh, colors even. It's very, very important to get down the really boring stuff. You might think, oh, I'm, I'm sick of drawing spheres and getting my ellipses down and drawing from the arm instead of the wrist. But it's so important later down the road because you can learn how to do like a copy of somebody else's concept art. And I love doing concept art but it's not the fully fleshed out idea and it's not the depth that you get from traditional artwork. And I've seen this on DeviantArt so many times, like having fan art or furry art or ponies. It's just not teaching you what actually goes into real fleshed out artwork. And I'm not trying to be mean, but it's a fun thing to do, I'm sure, but it doesn't give you any experience or really professional uh, level quality when it comes to regular painting and things of that nature. That brings me to my next step. Uh, don't try drawing from your mind when you're first starting out. It just doesn't work very well because unless you've seen something a million times, you aren't going to be able to replicate it perfectly. And you aren't going to be able to draw anything from your mind unless it's been put there by drawing it from reference before. It's an excellent idea to pick up a photograph or a magazine like National Geographic and actually sit down and make some studies off of that material because it's really high quality and it's from reality so that's the most refined version of the object that you're going to get. It's not a reinterpretation, it's not anything else, you're learning the pure form of the object and I like to relate it sort of to uh, the Mind Palace in Sherlock. You have this library that you can only fill by making more artwork and doing really in-depth studies and you're gonna get there unless you stop drawing from your mind and start filling it. So once you've started to fill your mind with actual stuff then you get to start replicating other artists. This may seem kind of weird to take a piece of artwork and then copy it down but it's really a learning experience because you get to know how they interpret the world and that influences you but you're only going to be as good as the artist that you let influence you. So if you're gonna copy some really abstract stuff or just somebody that's not very experienced, it wouldn't be a good idea because you're only getting that unrefined version and you aren't going to be as good as you could be if you're studying a really masterful artist like say Rembrandt or I don't know, some of the impressionists. Anything that gives you an insight into style and interpretation of the world. And don't copy another artist's style letter for letter because first of all it's not going to feel natural and second of all your style has to grow naturally from the artists that you let influence you and your own ingenuity and interpretation of the world um, so in that case just let it kind of naturally grow and don't focus on this is going to be my style just whatever feels right you know so another thing that gets in the way of your artwork is making excuses for yourself and particularly when it comes to tools so first of all tools do not make you better or worse they just make you faster or slower so if you give a you know crumpled up piece of paper and a dried out ink pen to the greatest artist ever whoever that may be he's gonna make something amazing it's just gonna take him a little bit longer same thing with you if you are given a awesome piece of hardware you're gonna do something crappy faster but it's not going to improve your artwork in any way. So when should you get new tools? Well, I had a really crappy computer and a bamboo tablet for three or four years, but I was still able to learn things and do pretty well. Uh, it was just a matter of it got in the way. That's when you want to upgrade your tools, is when they purposely impede your movement forward as an artist. Um, and don't spend too much money if you aren't going to go for the freelance route or you're just doing it for fun. Just get the minimal stuff that gets you started, like a bamboo tablet, which is 60 or 70 bucks nowadays. And you can think of it as an investment because I got that hardware when I first started out and I made enough money to get a new computer, a new tablet, a new keyboard, 
a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, it's going to improve your workflow and it's going to make you faster. So it really is an investment, even though it depreciates in value very quickly. Another extremely common excuse is, oh, I don't have enough talent and I'm just not good at drawing. Anybody with a good mental and physical capacity can do artwork. Talent is just the starting point. It's how much stuff you have in your mind palace before you start doing artwork. But just because anybody can do it doesn't mean everybody does do it. There's a reason for this. It's because it takes a lot of time and effort and pain to be a good artist. It's not something that happens overnight. It happens over years. It's not something that you can just pick up in a week unless you have uh, some talent to start with. That being said, don't just practice, learn a whole bunch as well, because tutorials will teach you things that you would never have thought of, and uh, just watching something like this, and watch other videos beside design as well, because they're chock full of awesome stuff. And uh, supplement that with practice, don't just look at tutorials, actually do stuff, because you can have a lot of know-how, but not a lot of muscle memory, and it's important to exercise just like you would physically, only with artwork. And if you get out of the swing, it might actually affect how good your artwork is. So now I'm going to dive into Photoshop and just show you a few little things that I know about painting specifically. Alright, so in Photoshop I want to show you a few things before you jump into painting that I normally do. So whenever you make a new document, and it's Control N for those of you who didn't know, um, I usually like to do 1280 by 720 if you have a lower end computer. Nowadays I actually do US paper uh, horizontal or something like that, or uh, 1080p, just so that I can work with higher resolution and uh, get some more texture in there, but that's only because my computer can actually handle it. Um, otherwise this is normally pretty good size for most things, if, and if I'm doing like sketches or something then that's what I'll do. Okay, once you're into this, uh, then just double click that and hit OK and that will turn that into a layer so you can actually affect the transparency and other things, but normally I don't touch that layer beyond um, actually turning this to a gray color. So I like to go to 50% gray and fill it. And I just like to do this because, first of all, most scenes aren't going to start with a complete white background unless it's a special case. And it's a little bit easier on the eyes, so you won't get as eye, eye strain as easily with a uh, gray background. And um, it makes shading easier since you have a mid-tone and then you can also darken and lighten as opposed to having white where you can only darken. So it gets a lot of things out of the way for you. Um, so uh, one thing you'll notice is that I switch back to default colors and one way you do that is uh, if you have something else selected, say that color, um, you can hit D and I'll switch back to this. So if you're sketching or something, and then you can hit X to switch in between. Um, let's see, what else? So whenever you're first starting out with Photoshop, I would suggest um, staying away from the layer system uh, for a few reasons. There's a lot of different things that can be confusing with it and you're just like, oh, what is all this? Just start with one layer and uh, paint or draw like you normally would, just to get the hang of the controls and uh, the hotkeys for painting itself. And then once you know a little bit more about layers, you can start doing some fancy stuff. But um, before you do that, I want to show you something that's very, very tricky with Photoshop. And I wish they would fix this. It's been, I don't know how many revisions, but they still haven't fixed this. Um, most often, if you switch a layer, like I just did, and then you start painting, it actually switches back to the layer. So it doesn't take into account you switching layers whenever it does undo. And this is really, really annoying. So. In order to combat this, what you do is whenever you want to switch to a layer and start painting, you select it, hit Control A, then Control D, and just do it really fast. And uh, that way, whenever you paint and then you hit undo, it won't switch back to the other layer as opposed to doing something else like this, and it switches back. So that's an essential trick, and I've gotten into so much trouble not using it because you'll be thinking, oh, I'm painting on this layer, but then it'll be an entirely different layer. And you'll get really frustrated. So, second uh, tip is masking. I didn't know about masking for a very long time. I knew that there was a select tool, um, but I, I always thought it was just for 
just doing like little edits and things like that. What I didn't know is that you can actually turn this selection into a layer mask. So you have the selection, you hit this button down here, that makes it a layer mask. And what this means is that you can paint all you want within this mask and it won't go anywhere else. And that's very, very useful whenever you have a character or a background and you want to be separated from another element and not have any bleed through, which was a big problem when I was trying to shade things. I'd always have to clean up afterwards and it'd be so just time consuming and stupid. But anyways, uh, that's one way to do it. Another way is you can paint out a object without a mask, and then you can hit con hold down control and select it, and that'll select everything in the layer. This will create a mask from that uh, selection. You'll see that it kind of affected the transparency, and I don't like doing this uh, especially. So what instead I like to do, and this is what I like to do instead of using layer masks most of the time, is hitting this button right here. What that does is that it makes it so that I can't paint outside the lines and it keeps the transparency of the layer uh, constant. That's very useful. Um, okay, so another thing you can do if you don't want to keep it all on one layer um, is you can create a new layer and then hit create clipping mask. And what that means is that anything you paint within this layer, this new one, will not go outside the lines of the other layer and it won't affect the transparency either. So, I believe, yeah, that's how it works. And if you uh, delete the layer, you still have the thing underneath, which is a nice non-destructive way of doing things. But don't get too caught up in layer systems just yet um, if you're just starting out, because it's very, very, uh, it can get in the way very easily if you don't know what you're doing. So just start with one layer, and by the way, hotkey for deleting a layer is just delete and you're good. Um, and let's see what else. Okay, so whenever you're shading an object, let's say I have a ball here, or whatever, and I want it to be a certain color. Uh, let's make it a nice reddish color. And this is by far not the best uh, technique in the world, but um, Let's just say we have this and we have a nice sphere and we want to shade it. And by the way, to hide a selection, the little, uh, these marching ants, in it, control H. I'll just hide that annoying thing. Uh, anyways, so if you're shading something, normally the first uh, instinct would just be go with the brightness and uh, increase decrease this value here or go just straight down that's not what you want to do uh, most of the time there's other hues involved so most of the time whenever you have a lighter uh, color it's not going to be as saturated just generally unless it's a neon color which is very artificial and doesn't happen very often uh, so I like to have very unsaturated light tones and then very saturated dark tones that just makes it a little bit uh, a little bit more warm, I guess. And then the mid-tones are just uh, kind of a, you know, mild uh, saturation. And there's always exceptions to this rule with different materials, but generally that's just the way uh, shading works. Um, so you can try that. And then there's another tool if you just want to do a um, very subtle, you know, increasing lighting or decreasing lighting. So you have the dodge and burn tool. The dodge tool increases brightness, or well actually no, increases exposure, I think, yeah. And then burn tool uh, decreases exposure. So it's not the most accurate thing to do because it really messes with your saturations, but it does uh, make it a little bit easier just to go in afterwards, after the fact, and adjust the lighting. Let's say you want to do a study of a photo like this. Uh, your first impression might be to just color sample everything and paint over on a new image uh, like this. Just color sampling this and painting it over here. But that's not the best thing to do simply because it doesn't increase your color perception hardly at all. Um, since 
each of these ha each pixel has its own color value in this photo and color sampling it will only give you one pixel of information whereas if you actually look at it as an artist and kind of try to guess out what the actual color is like uh, let's say this color up here um, it'll actually increase your color perception over time and it's important to do that because not every color seems uh, to be what it is within its context um, for example the color down here it might look just brown grayish but it's actually over in this range it's actually a very bright uh, purplish color that's because of the atmosphere and the shadows um, so it's not always what it seems uh, same goes with this color over here there's a lot of different hues going back and forth in here so it's very important that you understand those before you start painting uh, just by using this thing because it's good for to check yourself it's like oh I want to make sure that this is pretty accurate but it's also very nice to have good color perception so that you can actually exaggerate colors say it was down here uh, that purple tone if I can find it again uh, you can actually take that and you can bump up the saturation and the brightness a little bit and actually get a very uh, exaggerated color which is proves to be a very um, interesting image to look at whenever you have heightened colors like that. So let's say you have your painting done and let's just assume that this is your finished painting and you're a really awesome painter. Uh, what you want to do um, if it just doesn't strike you right or you don't like the colors in certain areas is you can use the, these uh, filters over here to adjust the colors. One of the first things you might want to do is uh, increase the brightness maybe or decrease it or just increase the contrast by doing an S-curve like this. Um, but most of the time what I do first is actually go into the levels and make sure that this is balanced. See that there's a lot of uh, info in the a lot of colors in the dark regions but not many in the very bright regions so I'm actually going to bump this up a little bit by compressing it down slightly and that makes it so that uh, there's a little bit more contrast. You can also shift it either way by going like that. And there's lots and lots of videos about how to do this sort of thing uh, with photography, which I very, very adamantly recommend you check out because it helps uh, with your composition quite a lot. Uh, another very cool tool is the hue uh, changer. So it might seem kind of cheesy of, you know, making all these outrageous colors, but you can actually use it to your advantage. Say you have a black and white image and you want to add a little bit of color into it, like a antique photo type of style. So yeah, this isn't strictly black and white. Um, if I actually sample from this, you'll see that the colors are a little bit brown. You can actually influence the uh, saturation there and you can do all sorts of colors. And uh, that's just by checking on this colorize thing. You can also increase, decrease, but I wouldn't use that very much. Um, just use the curves or the levels instead. Um, but yes, and you also notice that these actually come with a mask already applied to them. So let's say you want just to adjust the colors in a certain area. You want to boost them up or something like that. You can select the layer mask over here and then hit Alt Backspace to fill it with black. Then you can use a soft round brush, switch over to white, and paint in areas uh, that you want to be a little bit different. This might look terrible right now, but in the proper context, it can be very, very useful. You can also use um, the lasso tool. And if you increase the feathering up here, it actually makes it so that it's a uh, softer fall off. So see that's not very harsh. If I were to do this at zero pixel feathering, um, it would be a very harsh fall off as compared to this right here. For a better example, like that. Anyways, uh, that's about all I have to share as far as uh, beginning tips go out uh, goes, and I wouldn't recommend doing this uh, unless your intermediate kind of person uh, using these different adjustments. And if you are going to do it, look up some photography editing videos because they're very helpful in uh, getting to know how to use these tools. But uh, that's all I have for today. 
Thank you for watching. If you found it useful, like, share, subscribe, whatever you want to do. But uh, I'll see you next time.